All right. Hi, guys. Welcome to uh, Tales from the Trenches. Oh, there's water. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Tales from the Trenches. Uh, the good, bad, and ugly of Obitsac operations. The good news is we are the only thing standing between you and the end of the summit. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, there was a one of our one of my colleagues or one of my friends was not able to make it. John Dewey. He was supposed to give this talk. So, uh, one of my co current colleagues, uh, Jesse Keating, is going to help me give this talk today. I am not the John Dewey you were looking for. Uh, oh, that's me. Uh, so I'm Jesse Keating. Uh, I have been, for the past couple years, the deployer of the public cloud. Uh, we like to call our stuff the Kraken. We release it frequently. Um, before that, I was a release engineer for Fedora for about seven years. I've uh, been a contributor to Ansible, the orchestration engine, uh, quite a bit, and to many other open source things uh, besides that. And my name is Craig Tracy. Um, as this slide points out, you may remember me from the failed uh, keynote at the Portland Summit. Um, but I've been involved in OpenStack now for uh, probably a little bit over three years. I've been a contributor to OpenStack, contributed to a whole bunch of ecosystem type projects around OpenStack, as well as uh, other public, public, public cloud providers. Um, so basically, day to day, it's soup to nuts, OpenStack. I'll go. Perspective. Go ahead. So, uh, one thing when, that we discovered when we were uh, coming up with the content for this talk is that each of us had very different perspectives. So, right now, I'm at a company called Blue Box. The the uh, business that Blue Box is in is selling private cloud as a service, which means we stand up uh, a very small or small to mid size OpenStack clouds for customers, completely dedicated to them. Whereas Jesse's coming from a rack space at Public Cloud, which is an entirely, entirely different thing. Right. So I'm also a Blue Box employee, uh, but a few weeks ago I was a Rackspace employee. And at Rackspace, um, we dealt with a small number of very, very large clouds. In fact, they were all pretty much the same cloud. Uh, they all had the same uh, auth endpoint. You could move stuff, or you could launch stuff in one or the other or the other. Um, but essentially, they were, they were six mostly independent, very large public clouds. So just this is my own curiosity, and we were talking about this just before the talk. I'm curious to see how many people are, are operators of a of a public cloud or or a OpenStack cloud today. Okay, that's a good number. And like, let's say on uh, is that multiple clouds? If you're managing multiple clouds, how about greater than more than one? <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you have, yeah, how many things do you de independently deploy to that you have, might have different versions of OpenStack running on? Okay, and have I, like, maybe more than 10? Okay. A few, all right. That also adds, I think, a bit to the perspective of what people are doing. So the first thing we want to talk about is installation. And this is really tales from the trenches, but as an operator, one of the things that you're going to have to deal with is installation. And... Um, there's a famous quote. There's this famous quote. Does anybody know who said this? It was me. <laughs> it is not a solved problem. Uh, I Maybe about a year ago, I thought that this was a solved problem. And uh, I, one of the projects that I contributed to quite a bit was the OpenStack, uh, sorry, the StackForge Chef Cook books. I was a core contributor for quite a, time, quite a while and saw a ton of churn in, in those cookbooks. That, th that churn continues today. Um, there are tools out there that you can use. You can use Chef, Puppet, Salt, um, Ansible. Ansible. And our tool is Ansible based. It's called Ursula. Uh, there'll be a link for it at the end. But one thing that made me really realize this is when I looked at the source base that we have on Ursula today, it's uh, 15,000 lines of code. Uh, there are over 1,500 commits that happen all the time. And last week I submitted a pull request that was 1,500 lines itself. So is, this is definitely not a solved problem yet. Um, when, I, when I joined Rackspace, I thought it had been a pretty much solved problem, too. They, they were fairly well established. I was coming in to help them out with a lot of the automation, a lot of the, the more interesting things that I thought of at the time. Um, but in reality, uh, as we got better and better at doing our rollouts and doing our installs, we realized that a lot of the decisions we made and how we did our installs were having profound impact in what we were able to do with our cloud later on. And so um, before I left, we were in the investigation process of rediscovering and, and revamping how it is that we install and manage our OpenStack. So installation, by far, not a solved problem. Yeah, and you no, know, I think it's installation is a very 
uh, personal thing or, or personal to your business and, and how you deliver it. So these projects like the, the open, source, open source chef cookbooks or even our code is very opinionated. Um, we welcome contributors, but and we'd be happy to make it as unopinionated as possible, but um, it still ends up being something like that. There's also a, a relaunched effort at uh, beefing up the uh, OpenStack playbooks for Ansible for creating an OpenStack environment. Uh, it's going to happen on Stack Forward. It's going to be a reference model for how to stand up. And we're going to attempt to make it as unopinionated, or at least as, as to start with as unopinionated, but with the hooks in there to make it as opinionated as you want to. So as we, as Jesse and I talk more about our different experiences, you know, again, me, me delivering lots of small clouds, whereas he's delivering one large cloud. One thing that was that became clear to us is that despite our differences in the way we install, despite our differences in the way we operate it, uh, especially around installation, there is some kind of convergence in the community. It seems that people are starting to deliver things in in a um, in an, with artifacts, uh, containers. Is seems to be a very popular thing right now. There's a whole slew of new projects around delivering OpenStack with containers. Yeah, I mean, if if you looked from the past couple of years, everything sort of starts off as DevStack. You know, it's this great thing that you can do or and drop, and it's a working cloud, and, and everything's great because it worked in DevStack. But um, once you take that into production, you realize that you can't really manage that. But a lot of the production deployments, particularly for the smaller clouds, look a lot like DevStack, where you have all of your services running on a single system. Or very, and if you want any sort of HA, you just duplicate that over and over and over again. Um, but as, as we uh, moved on, it became more apparent that trying to run more than one service in the same environment was kind of a hassle, uh, particularly as each of the OpenStack services sort of became a little bit more independent, started becoming, becoming more uh, opinionated about their dependencies and operating at different schedules. It, it really, really started to become apparent that each of these things are, are loosely um, coupled, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, service microservices that sort of interact with each other at an at a API level. So the, the move to take these things out of being a monolithic thing that you just stamp out 10 of them uh, into little individual pieces of services that you put in as many places as is appropriate for that service is starting to really become clear, at least to us and to, to other people in the operator community. Yeah, our, our job, again, spitting out uh, large numbers of small clouds is to make sure they look the same all the time. So artifacts for us is key. Um, and things that we learned along the way. So first off was that distro packages were not going to cut it for us. Uh, there are many, many, many times that we are going to want to add our own uh, changes to OpenStack. OpenStack is an internally evolving thing, and we do not want to be beholden to the cadence of any kind of distro. Uh, you could you could do your own packages, but as a guy that did my own packages for seven years, that's not really a job that you want. Uh, you want to be focused on getting your changes integrated with your code and out into your cloud. You don't want to be dealing with the, the intricacies of how do you build a deb today, or where did my RPM dependency go to build this thing, and where do I put it, and how do I update the apt cache, and how do I make sure that all these things are in sync. That's just not interesting problems, so what's what's the better option here? Okay, how about another poll? Of the people who are deploying OpenStack, are you guys using distro packages? Maybe a raise a hand. Wow. Uh, how many of you have made customizations to those distro packages? Okay, yeah, good. Pretty much on That's the what same I like number. To yeah. So at the same time, for us, deploying from source is not really an option. Uh, we have done this, and this is proven to be difficult. Um, the problems that you run into are right off the bat dependencies. So um, the the Python communities, as well as the system level, de system level of dependencies that you have, are constantly moving. So I cannot tell you the number of times that we've been bit by some upstream Python change that's happened, uh, or some system level dependency that's kind of moved on where we're not locked down enough. Um, the and for for anyone that's accustomed to the way OpenStack is delivered, the requirements.txt files are not hardly versioned. Um, they kind of say, "Hey, we want this package greater than or equal to 1.4," and that doesn't really cut it in production. Yeah, along with, with the problems of deploying with source, I mean, that's, that's kind of the model you see a lot of, of new age developers, where you just throw up a vagrant, you get pull your source, and off you go. Uh, but often, you'll wind up with different things running in different places at different times. And uh, Craig, you know, he has a really strong desire that all of his clouds look the same, um, even though they're getting deployed at different times. And as a uh, the large 
huge cloud deployer. I want all of my instances that are running the cloud to all look the same because I don't want my, my operators and my admins having to figure out um, you know, this version of this library is working here, but this version, other version of this other library this, on this other node in the same cloud is not working. And, and so we needed to have consistency across the board of what we were putting out into our, into our environments. Sure. So with that, um, this was uh, kind of a sore spot for me. So uh, I worked together with John Dewey, uh, and we started up a project called GIFWrap. And GIFWrap, the whole premise of GIFWrap is, is to take OpenStack, which has always been delivered as an integrated release, not a product or a set of packages, into, pro into packages that you can consume. So what GIFWrap does is it goes off to uh, Garrett and basically decides what kinds of packages it has to use. It uses Garrett. Um, uh, and as well as DevSec to determine its dependencies. And out the bottom will land either an RPM, a Debian package, or now um, we will we have it already working in test but not checked in yet, a, a Docker container. And that's the, dire that's the direction that we're moving in terms of shipping our bits. We intend to ship all of our bits in Docker containers. Um, so lay down a base OS with Ironic because again, we're using images, something that we know. Uh, and then we will lay Docker containers on top of it. Again, something we know and that's easy to upgrade. Uh, we, this was a really good convergence point, uh, kind of like you can see on the, the train map that, that uh, Craig and I realized that um, within Rackspace, we had an internal tool, um, the public name now for it is Striker. Uh, it's going to be thrown over the wall soon, I hope. Um, but it was doing a lot of the same things in a slightly different way. It would, it would pull down Git from upstream OpenStack uh, repositories, use a tool called, uh, and I'm drawing a blank, but it integrates the localized patches that Rackspace might have into each of those different repositories, uh, do an examination of the requirements files plus anything that we've hacked in that we've realized is a requirement for this particular project or a certain version requirement, and build individual virtual environments for each of our services. Uh, we wouldn't go down the path of building a package or a, a container yet. What we've done is just build a large tarball that is all the different individual virtual environments. We toss in our uh, configuration manifests to configure all those services and wrap all that into just one big tarball that we toss on our payload server. One thing I didn't mention about GIFWrap, GIFWrap also uses the virtual uh, technique yeah. for ensuring that the service is isolated in terms of its Python dependencies. Let's talk about operations. How many of you guys, well, a lot of you were installers. Do you also consider yourself like long-term operators? How many operators have we got? Oh, we already asked that question. Mm -hmm. Same hands. All right, cool. <laughs> I have a short-term memory issue. <laughs> Who am I? Uh, so one thing that was uh, critical for us in stamping these things out is how we get to our initial architecture. And um, we, so we announced our, our offering for the first time back in a year ago uh, in November of 2013. Uh, at the Hong Kong summit, and we went GA in, in May. One of the things that got us to where we needed to be almost immediately was we unified our architecture, meaning that we could uh, take any single one of our nodes and run any one of the services on those nodes. Um, and in many ways, uh, well, we, in, in many cases, we we're actually co-locating compute as well as controllers on the same nodes. Um, this becomes problematic when you get into certain types of workloads and, and scale scenarios. So for us, um, we, we made a very clear decision uh, recently to start breaking these services out and make sure that these service are, services are composable by themselves. Uh, so if you have a heavy, let's say you have, for instance, a very heavy um, workload in terms of image writing. So if you have a 200 gig image, every time you write that image to the same controller node that's serving up your API requests, you're going to take a hit. So having these, these services be composable in such a way that you can break them out into different nodes if you have to is, is a great thing to do. So I, in my estimation, I'd say uh, going with the unified architecture to begin with is great. It's a great vehicle, vehicle for getting you started, but it may not be where you want to land long term. <laughs> At the same time, you want to make sure that you're not building snowflakes, right? It doesn't every stack, again, we're in, the process, we're in the business of building or stamping out these stacks one by one. We don't want snowflakes that we can manage. Just like we don't, don't want to manage these crazy dependency chains, the same thing goes for how we stand up the stacks. Snowflakes are not allowed in what we build. Um, and with that comes some kind of improvisation, right? So if, one thing that I always think about, like in terms of the way we built our stacks, 
because some of them are so small that we're not including things like Swift, we're doing things behind the covers that make it look like Swift. So Swift, like, look like Swift is there. So for instance, if you think about Glance, Glance can back right into Swift, and then you, have, uh, you can have multiple Glance uh, services that are talking back to Swift for sh sharing up images. Because we are a private cloud dedicated to one customer, they might, they might not have the capacity for a Swift cluster. In this case, uh, we are doing things like our syncing images across different Glance nodes to make sure that the image is always available for a Glance request. And uh, my last um, uh, recommendation around architecture is that is to always make sure that you're separating your control plane and your data plane operations. So uh, you will undoubtedly, no matter how big or small you are, be asked to add more capacity to your cloud. And by separating the control and data plane paths, uh, when you get the new node addition request, uh, you will be able to operate on that single node instead of it touching the entire stack. So let's move on to the next. So this is a less pretty graph, a less pretty picture of very small text that I could find earlier today. This is more of a picture of what a uh, Rackspace public cloud looks like. So Craig has a very interesting constraint in that his cloud has to exist entirely for his customer. So he has to stamp out a whole control plane for each customer and it can't be co-located with anything else, which means that they have to utilize some of that customer capacity for their control plane. Um, Rackspace had something of a, a big benefit here in that we had an internal private cloud that we could use to run our public cloud. So essentially we had an infinite number of resources at our disposal to, to launch our, our, our control plane for our public cloud. And the only physical constraint was the number of hypervisors we're gonna plug into it. So uh, essentially from day one, or at least from the day that I got there, all of our services were separated out. Um, every single Nova API was its own virtual machine, uh, its own instance on our internal public cloud. The, uh, the Nova cells, the console, Glance API, all of those things, if it was a service uh, that ran out of a virtual environment, it was 99% likely to be its own VM. Um, we might size it down, size it up, but it's gonna be an entire VM. Uh, we also broke things into cells so that we had, um, we could treat a r set of physical hardware on its, its somewhat on its own, um, but break apart how much traffic was going on. So um, we had a lot of sprawl of uh, control plane uh, consumption or control plane instances, uh, no matter how small our cloud was. But it got us around a lot of the problems that, that Craig was having. We could easily target uh, just Nova API to do something, or we could easily target just Nova Compute to do something. Um, but even this is not quite the best because if for a very small cloud, like say for a dev environment, we're gonna be consuming 15, 20 VMs just to manage two hypervisors and that's pretty darn heavy. Uh, so again, we're, not we, but Rackspace was going down the road of trying to shrink this down. Uh, we didn't want to go back to the world where services were stacked on top of services because that gets really ugly on the system. Uh, but what we did want to do is take these things that were consuming a full instance, shrink it down into a container, and then you could stack them on, on each other, but they're separated out enough so that they, they almost feel like different operating systems. So uh, again, if you, can, if you can afford it, if you can design for it, um, isolating each one of your services down into uh, the smallest thing you possibly can is really, really powerful in what you can do with the orchestration across your cloud. All right, so let's talk about upgrades. Um, you know, installation, that, that problem that we solved earlier, um, that's, that's the easy part. Once you get it installed, you then have to upgrade it. Uh, otherwise, you get um, you know, lots and lots of bugs pile up, features go missing, uh, and it's, it's kind of a hard problem. The longer you wait, the, the harder it is to upgrade. You have to rent that forklift, lift everything up, drag it over here, set it down, and pay all the penalty along the way. Uh, so upgrading early and often is highly recommended, but upgrades can be kind of hard, uh, particularly when you start looking at uh, how to do upgrades at the same time that your customers are using your cloud. So uh, in a lot of Craig's clouds, uh, they're single tenant. They have one user for that cloud. Uh, it's kind of easy when you're working with one user on a smaller scale to come up with a good agreement on certain times of the day that you can go in and disrupt their services to do your upgrades. The Rackspace public cloud had, has something on the order of hundreds of thousands of users. 
Um, I couldn't get 10 of you guys to agree on where to have lunch together. There's no way I'm going to get 100,000 users to decide on a good time to upgrade the cloud. I couldn't even get that many people to decide on what a time is, because time is across the globe. It's somewhat meaningless. Uh, so we always have to operate as if there are constantly live users who very quickly turn into angry users when the cloud doesn't work. And that said, I mean, it's still the, still, the goal still is near zero downtime for yeah. upgrades. So, so in order to get zero downtime, you have to start diving into things like how do I run one Nova API with version A and another Nova API with version B in the same cloud. Uh, and that gets really tricky when you start diving into the way that Nova works and the way that Nova does RPC versions for their messages, but also changes the content within the message without any sort of versioning along with it. Um, good times. We also have to deal with database migrations and when and where to restart our services. Um, we had a really fun deployment uh, about a year and a half ago that was maybe a month of change, didn't think it was that big a deal, rolled through our pre-productions just fine. We go to deploy to one of our large productions and the database, the, I think it was the Nova database migration starts. And goes. And goes. And goes. And goes. Um, and it goes some more. Uh, it eventually took about four and a half, maybe five hours to, to migrate our production database. And the way that Nova works, when that migration is happening, you can't really have any services running. So our cloud was just, nope, sorry, go away, for four hours. That's, that's a really, really long time to have an outage. Uh, and so that hurt a lot and started us down the path of actually checking how long migrations are going to take when changes are made upstream and checking how long they're going to take on our backup content so that we have a much better idea come deploy time as to how much outage we're going to have or whether or not we can do any adjustments to that migration ahead of time to make it hurt less. The other takeaway here is prune your data, right? So, oh, Jesus, yes. yeah, so OpenStack is notorious for soft deletes and if you can, please prune your data before doing the migrations. Yeah, the, one of the big reasons why the migration hurt is that you know, we had a very large cloud that had been running for a year and a half or more at that point with thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers doing whatever they do with the cloud, which is lots and lots of creates, lots and lots of deletes. And we didn't really have a policy for pruning the instance table, the instance data table. So that thing was huge. It was like billions of records or something odd like that. Uh, so if we had... Uh, had a policy in place of when we can prune and how much we can prune and where we would do long-term storage of the stuff we pruned out, it would have been much less of a problem. So there's, there's a lot of headaches you can, you can fix beforehand if you really plan and think about the fact that once you have it installed, you're going to have to upgrade it. So one thing that, um, that also kind of touches operations to some bit is, is how, does, how do your user inter users interact with the cloud that you've built? Um, being uh, someone who's stamped out a lot of these small clouds, this is something that for a long time was landing on my lap and, and now lands in support, um, in our support team's lap. But uh, things that always stood out to me are, th these are the types of questions that I would get from users all the time is, I actually can't believe how big this one is, is how do I create images? So a lot of people who have a Red Hat, Red Hat based release, they don't know how to create an image. They're coming from a legacy IT shop. Um, they want you to kind of help them help usher them along. So you should uh, use tools like Packer or image, uh, Disk Image Builder, show them how to do that and, and make it self-service for them. Um, I think this is probably a, a frustration for a lot of people running opera operations, both from an operator's perspective as well as from a user, which is the CLI. So CLIs um, are, they are, there's no consistency a lot amongst many of the CLIs. So for instance, I'll do a Nova list to show instances, but I'll do a glance image list to list images. Why is it not Nova instance list? Um, some of those small things, as well as if you think about, if you've ever used quotas before, quotas use a demand a tenant UUID, but they will accept a tenant name, and the tenant name does not work for adjusting a quota. Along those, and those are just some of the customer facing ones that, that do get people angry on mailing lists, and there's a lot more users than there are operators. Uh, under the covers, there's some operator-like CLI things that are just, just awful. Um, so in, in, the, in the cloud that I was helping deploy, we had five major databases that we'd have to migrate during a deployment. There were four different ways of migrating those databases. 
Uh, so every single database, every single service was a special snowflake in our automation, which made it very difficult to do some of the fun things we wanted to do when every single thing had to be different, had to be an exception, and it just added more and more and more lines to our automation tools, which just made it harder to make any changes to it. At the same time, we have a lot of users, again, coming from a legacy, legacy IT background that are, they want to use Horizon as their interface to OpenStack. Uh, Horizon um, also exposes things. You know, if you're, you'll expose things that they sh maybe perhaps shouldn't see because they're, they're, you know, they they shouldn't be messing with networks, uh, for instance, or uh, it doesn't provide some functionality that maybe they want to have. I once had a, a customer that uh, we were doing a migration for, and he, I said, well, what we'll do is we'll just move those, we'll take those instances from this host and move them over here, or retarget them to a different host. And he said, well, I can't do that because you know I haven't, I've never seen that tab in Horizon. And I said, well. Let me show you, the CLI, show you the CLI, and we can actually do this and, and move these instances over. Um, and then the other one that we get all the time is this one, is no valid host. Ha, ha, who's seen no valid host before? <laughs> and who's ever figured out exactly from just looking at that what the problem was? Really, yeah. can, can we hire you? <laughs> In my case, I usually know what happens if I see this. Because you know your cloud very intimately, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so this takes debugging, but for, from a user's perspective, this is a terrible user experience. Uh, people will try to spin up, you know, we, we have customers who, who use static uh, IPs, or they try to target an availability zone that's not present, and they'll get this. It, th this one error wrap, must wrap dozens of actual uh, underlying errors. And the way we deal with this is we're using... Um, uh, log aggregation through Logstash to expose this through Kibana. So a support guy can uh, can look at this and say, oh, this request for this instance, this is exactly what happened. Uh, but even at that, that's not really that great. We plan to extend that to users so that they can have a, a dashboard in Horizon or in our own uh, custom UIs that will show them the life cycle of a, of a VM. But again, this is something that we should fix in OpenStack. The, the Rackspace solution wasn't quite as elegant. We just shunt all of our logs to the same server, and we have grep for instance ID as a thing that we do, or for, uh, for reference ID. But of course, uh, those, those request IDs, they're in, in unique for a particular service. You know, Nova has a request ID when you want to build a server, but it's going to ask for a network from Neutron. Neutron's going to have a different request ID. So again, you end up having to play grep the rabbit down the hole to find out what actually happened. There's no real, real easy way to instrument a process from customer request or, or end user request all the way to fulfillment or error. So um, one thing that OpenStack has taught me is that these things, when they fail, they will fail dramatically. Um, and uh, for certain definitions of fantastic, I guess. <laughs> um, there's been, uh, there was a talk earlier that was, what was it? It was uh, many hours of uh, Oh, many hours of boredom punctuated by <laughs> moments of sheer terror. <laughs> Which I, I think sums it up completely. Uh, most times things are working really, really well, and then all of a sudden something happens, and you're like, what? Yeah, in this um, case, train arrived at the station. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I think it, one thing that was also pointed out in earlier sessions, and I think this is true, is that um, you need people who are, who, are very, who are very broad and very deep. So the, we're dealing with lots of loosely coupled, te loosely coupled technologies that you, know, you need someone who can dive in and figure out where the problem is across the entire stack, which um, is typically a very hard thing to do. Um, so let's talk about one of the failures that we had. Um, so this was one of the, one of the minor ones, but um, this was still fun. Uh, so when we were dealing with uh, Havana, Neutron Havana specifically, we decided that we were going to take a, a stable update. So we were going to move forward uh, on our stable branch and we would de deploy Neutron and things would be great because we would pick up all these changes. One thing that was not clear to me is that uh, apparently in stable branches we changed default configurations. And uh, what that meant for us is that when we changed the default config configurations for Neutron, all of the agents uh, would actually start flapping. And this is only because we were using one of the options, not both of the options. The two options are agent downtime and report interval. And for me, I don't know, as an operator, I don't think we should ever change defaults in a stable branch, but this is what we do. Um, this is another great example of, of broad but deep, right? So we have to have broad knowledge of how to deploy lots of differently independently working services and how to manage you know, packaging and, and 
uh, upgrading and database and all these things, but we also have to have deep knowledge of things in Neutron, like what does agent downtime mean? Or what is instant, or the, the check-in time mean? What real impact does that have if those two numbers change, right? So how do you have that very specific knowledge, but also have the knowledge to do everything else above that? Um. And more Neutron stuff. I, I'm not trying to pick on <laughs> Neutron here, but. Uh, so first of all, no matter what uh, configuration you're dealing with on OpenStack, it's typically complex. Um, and the, the lesson that we've learned here is that you only ship the config that you need, uh, not the ones that can get in the way. And like Jesse said, really understand uh, the config options that you're using. So this is one that bit us really, really, really hard. Um, we decided that we were going to move to VXLAN some time ago, and we did all the work, and we got it all working, and, and we went to go deploy to one of our first customers, um, and things went horribly wrong. Uh, what things we had went fantastic, yeah, fantastically wrong. <laughs> um, so there are two options in the Neutron config, and you can see this is now fixed. I pulled this from the latest source code for, uh, I believe it was this was from ISOS, I think. So there are two options. One was enable tunneling, and the other one was tunnel types, and you could select VXLAN, GRE, whatever. So we were in the midst of wanting to deploy VXLAN, so we said, okay, let's, let's start doing the, writing the code, and we wrote tunnel types equals VXLAN, and at the same time, we set enable tunneling equal false. Well, you would think that that would do nothing. That did something much different than that. <laughs> um, what that ended up being was uh, 45 minutes of entire data center downtime, and uh, for our hundreds of customers, and uh, four hours for that one particular customer. It ended up uh, creating VXLAN tunnels, and uh, we were in, essentially looping the network over and over again. All right, so I'm not gonna pick on Neutron, but I'm gonna pick on a few other things. Uh, so in our, in our wonderful world of scale, um, we have a couple of problems that we ran into and had to figure out how to address. So Nova Compute is this wonderful, cool thing that runs on all of your uh, hypervisors. And what it, it, it's kind of stateless, but kind of stateful. Um, it gets away with being restarted in that if you stop it, um, it forgets all of its state. And if you start it, it wants to remember all of its state. And the way that it remembers all of its state is it goes to the database and says, tell me my state. And tell me the state of everything that happens to be sitting underneath me. Um, Doing that on one Nova compute that's got five VMs sitting underneath it, not a big deal. Uh, we were doing it on you know 7,000 uh, hypervisors that had hundreds of VMs under many of those. And so um, in our ever going effort to do our deployments faster, we got better automation that let us to do this on more things at a time and we end up killing our database because all the Nova computes would come up and say, tell me everything and the database would just lose its mind. Um, so that was fun that we had to, to learn about how to do um, a much better job at bringing up our services. Uh, we also had a lot of fun with Glance. Glance has a few interesting properties to it. Um, first off, Glance API acts as an intermediary between your image storage land and the hypervisor that wants to use that image. And every time a hypervisor through Nova Compute asks for an image, Glance figures out what that URL is and then fetches it somewhat from that source and passes it kind of through. So your, your API ends up being an intermediary for the data that's coming across as well, which means that if you're fetching a whole lot of images, like say for 10,000 hypervisors, you have to scale out your API nodes. Um, through some, some interesting reasons, we end up having to list out all of the API nodes in each Nova Compute config file so that if one failed, it would find the next one and find the next one, but have a specific address to get to it. That meant that any time that we scaled, uh, that we needed to scale out our APIs and add a new one, we had to go and touch configuration files across all the Nova computes. C problem A. Um, a little bit more fun with Glance. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea to rotate our passwords for some of our services, one of our services being Swift. Swift being where we were storing our, our images. So we updated the, the Swift password, and then we updated the password in Glance. Everything looked great to start with. Uh, and then we started getting a few build errors for some of our older images. We weren't quite sure what was going on, weren't quite sure what was going on, couldn't figure out, couldn't figure it out. 
Eventually, we figured out that uh, Swift and its, or I'm sorry, Glance and its infinite wisdom was storing the path for the images in the database where it stored them. That path included the password. So, <laughs> you either have to trawl through your database and change all the passwords for all the images, uh, or you just don't rotate your passwords. Uh, I think this is still an open bug. It was kind of fixed, and then somebody said, but wait, what if I have multiple places with different passwords? And we just sigh. Um, and then finally, the, the, the other thing that you have fun with at scale is, is the cost of introducing a new feature. Uh, in our efforts to make our upgrades better, uh, we wanted to make use of conductor for compute. An external conductor shields the computes from the database writes. All the computes, instead of talking directly to the database, they send a message request to the conductor, and the conductor will talk to the database on its behalf. Uh, it also shields it from uh, internal object version changes. If compute gets an object from, say, Nova version five, but compute is running version four, compute can ask an external conductor to please translate this into something that I can understand and send it back to me. As long as your conductor can talk both five and four, it'll work. Really, really useful feature for doing rolling upgrades. Uh, but there's a bit of a cost. Um, it takes all of your computes that were independently writing to the database and instead shunts them all to the same thing to write to the database. So you should probably have more than one. Um, you should probably have more than two. And in, when we're dealing with 600 some odd hypervisors per cell, uh, you should probably have like three or four or more, we think. Um, when I went to go stand this up in our production after making sure it worked really, really well in, in pre-production, we ran into a problem that I kind of mentioned earlier. Every service gets its own VM. Uh, and we needed to isolate these per cell so that uh, only the computes in a particular cell would talk to this particular uh, conductor because they all use the rabbit that's per cell, it meant I needed to spin up, at a bare minimum, two conductors per cell, which meant that in one of our larger environments, I needed to spin up, uh, I believe, 50 new instances in our internal cloud um, with at least two CPUs in those instances. Uh, unfortunately, it had been one of the clouds that had been around for quite a long time and hadn't seen any capacity increase for a while because, hey, cloud is infinite, right? Um, of the 40 some odd that I needed to create, of the 50 that I needed to create, I think I got four uh, before I ran out of capacity. And so now we have to make a, a, a significant or somewhat significant uh, investment in the undercloud in order to roll out a new feature that saves us a few minutes here and there in some of our operations. So as you scale up, um, you, you have to kind of worry about some of these things of how will you scale out the thing that you use to run your cloud as you scale the capacity of your cloud. So then I tried to come up with a couple of gotchas that we had run into along the way. Um, one of them that we ran into was uh, DNS re resolution host names. So make sure DNS resolution and host names are always correct. Uh, your stack will look like it's working and it will, it will behave like it's working until it doesn't. Um, <laughs> We, so in particular, we had, a one pre, we had a bug with our Ansible code that was actually just mildly or writing the wrong host name into the Etsy host file. All kinds of things on the back end will, will be affected by that, so be aware of that. Make sure that that's right. We had our own little fun with DNS in that um, a while ago, we decided we wanted to start using DNS as a way of addressing all of our, our control plane instead of just using IP addresses. Um, DNS is a little bit easier to speak, a little easier to understand what's going on. Uh, and at the same time, we were, we were building up the automation for standing, stamping out our new cells and our new environments. And part of the automation was launch an instance in our undercloud, and then once you get the IP address that it got, create a DNS record for it. Well, fun little thing about DNS and A records is that you can have more than one of them. Um, so we sometimes got more than one of them. And uh, part of our launching our instances, you know, we embed an SSH key in it. And there wasn't really a whole lot of other validation that I'm talking to the thing that I want to talk to other than it accepted my key. So occasionally, we ran into some really, really fun things where a, our automation Ansible would try and connect to a particular system that it thinks is maybe a Nova compute, um, looks up the, the DNS record, picks one of the maybe 10 it got back, um, and logs into it. Uh, sometimes it wouldn't work, and that was okay. We always tolerate systems we can't connect to because you know, when you're at the scale that we were at, we always have some things that you can't connect to. 
Uh, but sometimes it would connect in, and it would be great until we started trying to do some somewhat destructive things. And then we realized that, oh, I'm not really talking to a Nova compute. I'm talking to a database node. Boy, it's a really good thing that we have database backups. So after that, we kind of went down the path of let's do some audits and make sure that we only ever have one A record for each system and that that A record is pointing to the system that we think it's pointing to. So really important that DNS is doing what you think it's doing. Uh, another one that we've run into is service ordering. So because we're not using distro packages, we are crafting our own upstart scripts. Um, and if you don't have those right, you will not know until you reboot that host. Um, so in one particular instance, we were actually starting up, we we're launching, restarting the instances after reboot before the networking came up. And as soon as you do that, the instances are, instances are unreachable and probably have to be rebooted anyway. It's just, uh, it, it's something that's fixable, but at the same time, something that's not optimal. Service ordering is also important, not just when you're rebooting a machine that has a whole bunch of services on it, but when you're orchestrating how you upgrade your services in a rolling manner. Uh, we recently introduced graceful shutdown of computes, and in doing that, we wanted to start addressing each of the services in somewhat of a logical order. And we thought it would be great if we, uh, on the way to doing a migration, we shut down um, all the API nodes so that no new requests come in, and then we shut down all the computes gracefully so that they could finish whatever they were doing, and then we can move on with our day. So we shut down all the services, and then we asked all the computes to gracefully shut down, and all the computes took a really long time. We couldn't really figure out why that was until the light bulb went on, and somebody said, hey, don't those computes that are doing things need the control plane to do them? So yeah, we should change that order. So. Or Ordering how you bring down your service and bring up your services does have kind of an impact in what's going on. There, as much as everybody likes to say services are magical, start them all up and they'll sort themselves out, um, it doesn't really work that way. Order is important. Yep, and the next two I think we've, we've already talked about, logs. Uh, I think everyone knows that logging is a problem. In fact, it, there was a session on Monday to rethink how we do logging. Um, I would recommend using some kind of log aggregator at least. Uh, uh, at the same time, actions are hard to trace across the stack. Um, we talked about that before as well. Yeah. RPC failures, um, so this is this used to happen to me much more, not so much recently, um, but it's very difficult to find the status of your services when RPC is not working correctly. Um, one technique that I've used there is just to use Nova Manage because you're going directly to the source of truth. Uh, Nova Manage uh, service list or something like that. Um, one thing that bit me recently, <laughs> Um, is, that, is database backups. Um, <laughs> Who here thinks that backups are a good idea? Every hand should be in the <laughs> air, right? So we're all gonna have something like this. So uh, we had three weeks in a row of Friday at 9 p.m. my time in Boston um, uh, for this one customer that was constant, like Keystone would just fall over on itself and I had no idea what was going on. It turns out that we had this errant cron job on there because it was our first customer, hadn't cleaned it up and we just had uh, backups going on top of backups on, on top of backups. And as soon as that happens, all bets are off. If Keystone's not happy, ain't nobody happy. Um, so we had our own fun with, with backups. It was similar. Uh, but we had an environment where, and I'm going to pick on it, but Neutron wasn't able to deliver IP addresses in a reasonable amount of time. And nobody could really figure out if it was sort of the environment that was the problem or if it was the service that was the problem. Because it seemed like the problem would follow with our uh, versions as we bumped our versions, but also we wouldn't experience it in some of our other environments. So we had a really hard time with you know, validating the environment, validating the new code, because sometimes it would fail, and sometimes it would work, and we really couldn't figure this out until we started doing some real deep analysis, and we didn't have a good, we, we didn't have a very good correlation system, um, which would have pointed this out pretty quickly, but what was going on is that we had a scheduled database backup that would hit every hour. And in this particular environment, we didn't have a slave database set up for that backup to hit, so our backups were hitting the production database. And when the backups would hit the production database, Neutron would get unhappy with its connection to the database and it would just slow down and not give out addresses. So any builds that were happening like in that hour or the 15 minutes after that hour that took for that backup to happen, it would just have a bad time. But only one environment didn't have that set up and that's the only environment we could see it and it only happened on the hour, so finding those types of things is 
is really kind of difficult. But since we all agree that ba backups are good, you have to be mindful of what that impact is going to be on your backups. And you have to be mindful of the, not doing you know, four backups at once of the <laughs> same database. Um, and the last one that, that it kind of annoys me a bit is uh, database modification. So there are many operations that you will undertake as you're operating cloud where you're going to have to modify the database. Um, the one that, that we ran into most recently is uh, we deploy Cinder with a default backend, and we don't define multiple backends typically, but in this particular case, we were adding an additional backend. As soon as you do that, you, there's no easy way to migrate to two backends instead of just one. If you look at the Cinder database, it, it'll typically be hostname, at sign, and the name of the backend. So what that meant for us is as we added the new backend in, uh, sure, we have the new backend working, but we have to go back and, and retrofit all of those volumes that are already assigned to the previous backend. Um, so something that's not optimal, fixable certainly, but uh, not optimal. So who here thinks it's a really good idea to have lots of people with direct database write access to your cloud databases? <laughs> Great, we're all on the same page here. <laughs> um, and then we just, so these are the references. Actually, the second link is wrong, so you can just tweet at me if you would like to uh, get the correct link there. I just realized that now. Um, as much as we've kind of crapped on OpenStack, I, I did mention to Jesse earlier or when we were doing this talk um, that I was having trouble coming up with really, really, really bad problems that we had. Um, it was, you know, when we did this abstract, I was like, okay, in the next six months, like, or the next couple of months, we're, we're gonna come up with more stories about things that have gone wrong. But for the most part, I've had sleep, uh, I've been sleeping, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, on, on the Rackspace side of things, a lot of our pain was because of our success. You know, the, we had problems from having a cloud that's really, really big, but we wouldn't have a really, really big cloud if it wasn't a really awesome thing that people wanted to use. So even though we have a lot of problems, we're still really, really grateful that we're working on, on pretty awesome stuff. We just got to make it even more awesome, right? I just said that a second ago. The, the I, I just created, I created it and I put a link to the real one. Ah, okay. <laughs> that's so an I, engineering solution right there. Yeah. So I'm going to move that over. Uh, it, it was in a different repo and I planned to move it over and I totally forgot to move it over. So I'll get that for you. But it will be there. And the obligatory uh, we're hiring slide. So um, if you want to help us make OpenStack awesome um, for small or big clouds, come see us. Yeah. So this is the last session of the day. We are standing between, well, we're no longer standing between you and, and beer. But if you have questions, uh, feel free to come on up. We'll, we'll talk them out.